this corpus liberties rights sovereignty all these concepts in law have their origin to the varna karta which was brought into existence in 1215 by king john and from there on it was repeatedly issued whenever there was a threat to the rights and duties we could not have had a better speaker to speak on this topic than honorable justice ms sona to introduce our speaker for today's evening to the gathering here can i request advocate nigel costa to kindly give us an introduction of our speaker Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's event, organized by the Goa High Court Bar Association, which is a lecture on the Magna Carta by the Honorable Mr. Justice M. S. Sona. The Magna Carta, or the Great Charter, as it was known originally, was granted and sealed during the reign of King John of England on the 15th of June, 1215. After many a discussion and deliberation, at Runnymede, a water meadow beside the River Thames. It was the first document that put put into practice the principle that the king and his government was not above the law, and forms the basis of civil rights and liberties espoused under the English common law, as well as the Constitution of the United States of America. The constitutional texts of many countries, including ours, bear a common thread tracing their roots to the Magna Carta. Therefore, it is a well worth a topic well worth knowing more about. Today's esteemed guest speaker needs no introduction. The Honorable Mr. Justice M. S. Sonam, Senior Administrative Judge. I am sure, in his usual articulate style, he will enlighten us all on today's topic. And therefore, without much ado, I will request the Honorable Mr. Justice M. S. Sonam to address the panel. Thank you. Shinde and Justice Lalita, President Pereira, and my dear friends, 11th and 12th of August are days sandwiched between holidays of solid five days before and five days after. Nevertheless, thank you very much for being here. I genuinely appreciate this. Magna Carta Libertatu. Was sealed, mind you, not signed, on 15 June 1215 at Runnymede between London and Windsor. This is a royal charter issued by King John of the Plantagenet dynasty to buy perhaps peace with his barons that had risen in revolt. But as we shall see, Magna Carta is a significant part of the legal traditions. in the united kingdom and also in the entire world shakespeare says that some are born great some achieve greatness and some have greatness thrust upon them the more that one reads about the history of magna carta the more one would be convinced that magna carta was neither born great nor did it achieve any greatness For its intrinsic worth or merit, but indeed, the last eight centuries have heaped greatness upon it in ample measure. Magna Carta is an icon; it's a powerful symbol of struggle against tyranny and absolute power. Magna Carta is a harbinger, if not the foundation, of the hallowed concepts of due process, rule of law, parliamentary democracy, independence of judiciary. That we sometimes tend to take as granted. Erwin Griswold. Now this is the Magna Carta. It's in Latin. Erwin <coughs> Griswold says that Magna Carta may not have been significant for what it was, rather for what it was made out to be. And over a hundred years, in 1915, on the 700th anniversary of this great charter, William Stuart Pickley said. that the greatest constitutional value of magna carta 
is lain not in its construction, but in its misconstruction. Not what it really meant, but what the people thought it meant centuries later. This is of course the Magna Carta, and I'm sure Sultan has shown you the Rani Bead earlier. This is the place where it was signed. This is a monument built by the American Bar Association. Incidentally, even our Indian government uh, has planted an oak tree. The Salvaris will be happy to know that. And uh, they put a uh, plank there uh, on behalf of the Republic of India. And then I think we have a quote by Winston Churchill. He says that here is a law which is above the king and which even he must not break. This reaffirmation of the supreme law and its expression in a general charter is the great work of Magna Carta and this alone justifies the respect in which men have held it. Now to appreciate the setting in which the Magna Carta was sealed on 15th of June 2015 at Runnymede, we must advert to the life and times of King John. Now King John belonged to the Plantagenet dynasty that ruled England from 1154 to 1485. They provided 14 monarchs to England. The Plantagenets were originally from a place called as Anjou in France. And so their empire was also known as the Anjivian Empire. Now you can see United Kingdom right at the top. And the rest of it is France. The portions which are in pink, red, and even dark blue, and even the light pink, that was the Angelian Empire. It was an Anglo-French Empire, or an Anglo-Norman Empire, because at the age we had Normandy. It was a huge empire, and the kings were common to both France as well as England. There was, of course, a French king at that time, but the French king had much less territories than this emperor. Now, Henry II, ascended the English throne in 1154 and as was customary, he granted a charter of liberties to mark his coronation. This was more or less similar to the promises that our politicians make <coughs> to come to power and no sooner they come to power. This is the Angelian family tree. Henry II was King John's father. He was authoritarian as all monarchs then were. He had a tip with the English church and he was responsible for the murder of Thomas Beckett at the Canterbury Cathedral. This is the murder at the altar of Thomas Beckett who was then thereafter canonized. This was in the year 1170 and uh, King Henry II is supposed to have remarked, will someone rid this turbulent priest for me? And that was followed by this uh, murder in the cathedral. Now Henry II was succeeded by Richard I, who was also known as Richard Lionheart. Now Richard was a very brave and courageous king, but he overspent and consequently he overtaxed his subjects to fund his wars and campaigns in France and also his crusade to Jerusalem. Richard became too powerful and thus a threat to all the neighboring kings, including the Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI. So in 1192, when he was returning from the crusade, he was imprisoned by the Pope and held a captive until 1194. The Pope said, I want a ransom of 100,000 pounds for Richard's release. Now at that time, the average revenue a king could manage to collect was somewhere within the range of about 15,000 to 20,000 pounds in the entire year. And here was a ransom of 100,000 pounds and that is where comes the phrase, King's ransom. It was indeed a colossal ransom. Now this amount was naturally collected through the English barons and the knights. The barons and the knights collected these amounts from their tenants and so on. Richard died in 1199 and there was a succession dispute between our King John and his nephew Arthur, Arthur of Brittany. Now Arthur was the son of uh, Richard's brother and consequently even he was uh, John's brother, John's elder brother. So it was a fight between the uncle and the nephew 
So John moved quite fast and was crowned as the king on 27th of May 1199. He became the king of England. Now John was Henry's youngest son. Before his birth, Henry had settled most of the lands in favor of his three elder sons and there was really no land remaining uh, to be given to this King John. So for this he earned the nickname of Lack Land or in Latin as it would be called as Sine Terra. Uh, Mr. Kulasu will forgive my pronunciation but Sine Terra, Lack Land. Now John, as you can see from the picture, was described as a weak, cruel, tyrannous, treacherous, lecherous, unfaithful, untrustworthy, and a thoroughly incompetent king. <laughs> now John Gillingham epitomized him in his memorable praise, and you will please excuse me for quoting John Gillingham. He said that King John was a ship. Now there have been almost 25 popes named John. There have been two kings of France, six kings of Portugal, and nearly eight emperors of Byzantium. Now Byzantium is Constantinople, modern Turkey. But there has been only one King John of England. And uh, Nicholas Vincent in his short introduction to the Magna Carta writes that in the 1370s, when it was rumored that John the God, who was the Duke of Lancaster, was about to claim the English throne, God's inauspicious name inspired the outcry. They said, no more King John. When Richard I as a prince had rebelled against his own father, King Henry II, what hurt King Henry the most was John's treachery in going and joining with Richard. When Richard went off for a crusade to Jerusalem, John attempted to pester a rebellion against Richard. Both Henry II and Richard forgave John but his tendency to treachery stuck. While imprisoned, John murdered his nephew Arthur and he threw the body in River Sienne. The most cruel affair is the De Brio's affair which gives an idea of the extent of John's cruel nature. Now in 1208, King John fell off with De Brio's family. They were nobles, they were also barons mainly because the erstwhile loyal family could not meet the king's outrageous financial demands. Now King John required Lord and Lady de Brewers to hand over their son as a hostage until their financial demands were met. That's Lady de Brewers and their young son. Now Lady de Brewers refused and quite indiscreetly she said that she would not trust her son's safety after what had happened to Prince Arthur. Now King John was enraged. The Lord managed to escape and flee. But Lady de Brios and her son were imprisoned in the Tower of London. I am sure many of you have visited the Tower of London. That is where they were imprisoned. They were locked. And the key was literally thrown into the river Thames. Both of them were starved to death. And what a horrible death it was. After several months, when the cell was opened, they found both of them huddled against each other in a grotesque knot of death. That there, that's where the phrase of knot of death comes. The lady had died insane in hunger and her last earthly efforts were to try and eat her child's face. Now King John was also described as a debauch, a womanizer, more experienced in wantonness than in warfare. There was no serious problem those days about monarchs womanizing. Henry had 20 illegitimate children. But the kings would typically bed wives and daughters, those below the status of knights and barons. Here, King John insisted on having the wives and daughters of the barons and the knights. This was not acceptable to the then nobility. King John was no good on the battlefield as well in the year 1200. After he ascended the English throne, he agreed on certain unfavorable terms with King Philip Augustus of France, thereby weakening his position. All these French territories were virtually 
conceded or his hold on them was considerably weakened and that is why john also earned the nickname soft sword soft sword now in 1202 john lost a large part of his algerian empire to prince uh, to king philip augustus anjo may turin normandy all of them fell to the french king okay. normandy fell in 1204 and this was virtually the end of the anglo norman empire or the anglo french empire i'm just discussing this because this gives us an idea of the circumstances in which magna carta came to be forced upon king john so this was about the personal character of king john now let us look at what were his relations basically we will analyze what were his relations with the neighbors what was his relation with the church and what was his relation with his own barons and with the own english people now in so far as relation with the neighbors is concerned king john had severe problems with the welsh people with the scottish people he maltreated them he also had considerable difficulties with king philip augustus of france the spark was king john's insistence on marrying isabella of angouleme isabella was 12 years old and she was a beautiful heiress now this was not only a political alliance but they say that john was virtually infatuated with her john was already married but he was prepared to divorce his first wife and get married to isabella but the problem was isabella was already engaged to her luciano and the lucianos were a very powerful clan so when so what they did was they appealed to king philip of france philip summoned john to his court and john naturally refused he said that i am also a king i won't come to your court so philip forfeited john's french possessions and promptly handed them over to his nephew arthur who was at that time alive now arthur conquered one important castle at mirabeau he also imprisoned his own grandmother and john's mother the 80 year old elinor of aquitaine at the castle now in a rare display of military might john marched a 40 miles distance in 48 hours and surprised arthur he repossessed mirabeau freed elinor and finally he murdered his nephew arthur and threw his body in the river seine now this enraged king philip and other nobles because even at that time there were rules and conventions particularly about treating political prisoners in short john's relations with his neighbors was were, were quite appalling now when it comes to the church please remember that church was one of the most important components those days the churches were not only spiritually but even financially very powerful and influential the kings ruled by divine right they acknowledged that they might be under god their coronation oath by which they swore to be good kings to uphold the law and to do justice was made to god in heaven not to their own subjects so when a monarch died perhaps damnation would be fall him he would perhaps burn in the fires of hell but this sentence however appalling for the dead monarch soul would have absolutely no effect in alleviating the impact of suffering on his subjects left behind on the earth it really did not matter to them whether the king would suffer in hell or enjoy the pleasures of heaven the rule of law in heaven was not as useful to them as the rule of law on earth so in 1205 when hubert walter the archbishop of canterbury died this is pope innocent the third okay, who was at that time the holy roman emperor or the pope at the vatican now when in 1205 when hubert walter the archbishop of canterbury died the issue of succession arose now the bishops of canterbury naturally wanted a say canterbury was not only a cathedral but it was also a monastery so the monks also wanted a voice in fact they wanted john the great to be the archbishop now king john naturally as the monarch and the head of the church wanted his appointee as the archbishop so there was a huge dispute and this dispute was referred 
for arbitration to Pope Innocent the Third. Now the Pope dumped all the three choices and he chose Stephen Langton, a theology professor based in Paris as the Archbishop. Now the bishops and monks reluctantly agreed because this was the decision of the Pope. But King John flew into a rage. Incidentally, Stephen Langton is the person who is credited with rearranging the Bible. The Bible was earlier not in form of chapters or verses, but it is Stephen Langton who in the 13th century undertook this work and uh, that is how the Bible was rearranged into chapters. Now John refused to accept the Pope's wording. He threw the monks out of the Canterbury Cathedral. He seized all their lands and the assets of the monastery. Now this was nothing but open confrontation with the Pope and the Church. So the Pope drew out his big guns. Now what were these big guns? First, the Pope issued what is known as the interdict. An interdict is something like a church going on strike. No religious services except perhaps baptism, no weddings, no burials in consecrated ground, and most important, no church bells. The church bells were not allowed to ring. Now this went on for almost six years between 1208 and 1214. This is the Canterbury Cathedral, and that portion which you see, that is the portion they say was done up in the 13th century. So it is that old. The cathedral itself is very old, but that particular section was in the 13th century. So first big gun was the interdict. Secondly, the Pope excommunicated King John. Now, excommunication meant that the Christians who could afford to could not deal with the king. So the bishops went out in exile in order to maintain their loyalty to the church. Now this was tremendous pressure on John. The most damning effect was on the people's psyche. The people began to wonder whether it was worthwhile to obey and be loyal to an excommunicated king. And they all expected that the Pope's next step would be to depose King John because that is what Popes had done in the past to errant kings. Now, with the Pope's tacit support, Philip Augustus, the King of France, got an invasion fleet ready to invade England. So in the year 1214, King John did something very, very dramatic in English history. What did he do? In 1214, he surrendered to the Pope and by way of surrender, first of course he accepted Stephen Langton as the Archbishop of Canterbury, which was all right. But second, he went to the extent of saying that I give my entire kingdom, entire England, entire Ireland to the Pope and thereafter receive this territories back as the Pope's vassal. So England and Ireland became a fiefdom of the Vatican as a result of John's action. With this dramatic move, the Pope was very happy and he became a supporter of King John. The Pope ordered Philip Augustus to back down. The excommunication was recalled. The interdict was hold back. But since this was a decision from the high command in Rome, the simmerings continued, though the expression of discontent was very dangerous. The clergy was not at all happy with this opportunistic King John. Now what about King John's relations with his own barons? King John, by excessive taxation, virtually looted his subjects to finance his wars to retain his Algerian empire. As a result, he lost his empire and also lost the sympathy of his own barons and of the peasants. In 1214, with the Pope on his side, King John made a last dish attempt to regain his lost empire. But King John suffered a resounding defeat at the hands of Philip Augustus in the famous battle of Bobines in the north of France. In fact, right now, it is a part of Belgium, Flanders. Now, in ancient or in modern times, whenever an authoritarian regime suffers a military defeat, it becomes vulnerable to internal opposition. This is what happened to King John. He had failed on all fronts, he had lost a major battle, he had lost a major war, he had lost his empire, and therefore he was now vulnerable in his own place. 
King John rode the barons too high. He was defeated and ruined. He needed to pay about 50,000 pounds to Philip Augustus for five year truce. He needed to pay his mercenary soldiers. Inflation was all time high in England. In short, he desperately once again needed money from his subjects. Now in those days, how did the kings raise their money or how did they raise their revenue? First was something known as feudal customs. This was because in theory, the king owned every single bit of land in his kingdom. The barons, the knights held the lands and estates under the king. He was their overlord. So the first thing was, under feudal customs, these barons and knights were required to pay or to give aid to their sovereign. And what is this aid? Aid is the payment which they had to compulsorily make, presumably as a gift, at the time of marriage of the king's eldest daughter. Second is relief. Now the laws of succession were fairly well settled during that time, but succession was not automatic. The intervention of the king was a must. Because once a baron died, his lands and estate would revert to the king. The king had to re-grant it to the successor. Now this came at a price. The successor had to pay, inverted comma, relief to the king. Scutage. Now what was this concept of scutage? This is a wonderful book. Uh, I've only read the reviews. They say it's a wonderful book which explains this concept. But in short, the barons were duty bound to join the king when he went to war. They had to also supply armed men to fight the king's war. This rarely happened due to various reasons. The barons may not be fit enough to fight a war. They may not have the risk appetite. The supply of some weak and reluctant men were also useless to the king. Therefore, a system developed by which the baron would pay scutage or some kind of a shield money or a protection money to the king instead of himself joining the war or supplying men to fight the king's war. Now this was called as the scutage. Now you can imagine the number of wars that King John had. He would constantly insist on a scutage. He would constantly insist on aid, relief. Maybe aid was not uh, constantly possible, but on relief, uh, the people were virtually looted. Now the kings would also charge an excessive amount for grant of lands and titles. The king would impose fines and penalties for breach of forest laws. Now please remember that forests were not necessarily wooded areas, but they were areas under the special jurisdiction of the kings. They were also wooded areas and we find uh, a lot of uh, mention about this in of course the fiction about the sheriff of Nottinghamshire and his problems with Robin Hood. Robin Hood and sheriff of Nottinghamshire episode took place precisely during the reign of King John. Now even justice at that time was not free. There were expenses at every step. Nevertheless, some of the kings established an efficient justice system. Not because it was their duty to do so, but because it was the most profit-making system. There was profit to be made simply by even delaying justice. Now, Queen Matilda's advice to Henry II, which has been recorded, was that it is better to delay justice and withhold judgment of a dispute if both parties could be persuaded to seek the king's friendship. So even friendship, mind you, was a commodity that could be brought and sold. Now all this exaction was not restricted only to the barons and the knights. Because the barons and the knights in their turn behaved in the same manner with their tenants and with the peasants. So the tyranny percolated to the poorest of the peasants. The barons and knights were naturally not happy with all this. The tenants and peasants were also not at all happy. There was simmering discontent everywhere. So the situation was ripe for a revolt. And revolt they did. England erupted into a civil war. The rebels got lucky and they took over London. John's treasury and a significant cache of arms fell in their hands. Negotiations for peace began. The lawyers of the day had a field time. 
Ronnie Mee was almost equidistant from London, where the rebels had held out, and the Windsor Castle, where King John was put. Drafts were exchanged and they were finalized. And finally, on 15th of June, 1215, in the presence of the barons, knights, and the peasants, King John sealed the Magna Carta. And that's the picture. That picture says that King John is shown as signing the Magna Carta, but the experts always point out that the kings were never signed, they would seal their documents. Now, most of the articles, now what is this Magna Carta all about? The Magna Carta was simply a charter which was sealed by the king in which he gave several assurances, he made several promises. He in fact agreed to behave himself. That is what is Magna Carta all about. It was not styled as the Magna Carta. Nobody called it as the Magna Carta. Nobody called it as Magna Carta, the Great Charter or anything of that sort. It was more or less a charter similar to the charters which had been issued even in the past. Most of the causes of the Magna Carta are specific to the times and issues which were then most relevant. Like for example, the charter fixes frequency of rates of aid, relief, and scootage. It says that okay, if a baron has to succeed, 100 pounds. If a widow has to remarry, 25 pounds. So actually the rates were fixed in Magna Carta. In addition, this charter deals with debts. It deals with foreign mercenaries because everybody was against the foreign mercenaries. There is a clause which says that foreign mercenaries should be expelled. It also deals with uniform weights and measures. It deals with fishing rights. It deals with forest laws, trading rights, fees and so on. There is, a, there is an interesting set of articles uh, which I think may assume relevance in today's context. Articles 29 to 31 provide. Yes, I say it is interesting from this context. Some days ago, we had to experience saying that I am the police, I will need drink, but I will not pay. Now, articles 29 to 31 of the Magna Carta read like this, that no constable, bailiff, or sheriff shall take anyone's corn, chattel, timber, horses, carts, unless they pay for them immediately in cash, or the seller agrees to postpone the payments. So the problems that we recently and allegedly faced at some Kalambur bar were not quite unique. The prosecution, Mr. Bobe and Mr. Vazay could rely on the Magna Carta. <laughs> but the charter's survival and flourishing for the last over 800 years is because the charter is associated with certain provisions of general application that have profound impact on the development of the law at the march and the march of the Western civilization. I say associated because not necessarily one might find precise provisions in the charter. Perhaps the barons on the soggy meadow at Runnymede may not even have dreamt of such a construction or interpretation of the charter. Please remember, it is the misconstruction that was more important. It is not what is actually said in the Magna Carta, but what it is supposed to have said, the interpretation. So Magna Carta is great, not because what it was, but because what it turned out to be, what it symbolizes, what it stands for, it is an icon, it is a symbol. Now let us look at some of these important provisions of Magna Carta of a general application. Some crucial provisions are found in Articles 39 and 40 of the Magna Carta. Magna Carta's famous guarantees that no free man shall be arrested or imprisoned or decised or outlawed or exiled or in any way victimized, neither will we attack him nor send anyone to attack him except for the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Friends, this was nothing but the embryo of due process. The king could no longer arbitrarily or at his whim arrest any person. If you want to arrest somebody, if you want to convict somebody, you have to go by the lawful judgment of his peers. This is the embryo of the jury trial or the law of the land. 
which is nothing but due process, which is nothing but the rule of law. And Article 40 said, to no one shall be sell, delay, deny, right or justice. In the words of Lord Dinger, these two articles and the words of these articles still have the power to make the blood erase. And I, we all should really agree with him. Because this is Magna Carta, it says that to no one will be sell or deny or delay right or justice. That's what Article 40 says. That's Martin Luther King. He says justice too long delayed is justice denied. That speaks about arbitrary arrest. Now these articles are embryonic of due process. No more arbitrary arrest. No more seizure of property at the whims of a despotic monarch. The seeds of jury trial. The seeds of rule of law itself. No wonder these words find an echo in most of the liberal constitutions world. Now coupled with these articles are some others to revamp the justice delivery system. There are provisions that courts and judges should meet at fixed places and at defined intervals so that the people know where to go for their remedies. Earlier the court system was that wherever the king travelled, the court would travel with him. So there was absolutely no certainty as to when you could go and seek some redress. Even after paying money, there was no guarantee as to when you would get justice. Then there are provisions which say that the judges must not only know the laws of the realm, but should themselves be minded to observe them faithfully. So the requirement that there should be qualified judges, judges who know the law of the realm. There are provisions about burden of proof. There are provisions that punishments must fit the crime. And the fines must not be so excessive as to deprive a man of the right to survive or the right to earn. These are nothing but the seeds of what we today call as a doctrine of proportionality. Now in 16th century, if you permit me to... Uh, I'm still in history, I, I hope it is alright. But uh, in the 16th century, the English monarch James I insisted that since he was the fountain of justice, he would himself decide the court cases. Now, Sir Edward Coke, the earlier Attorney General and the later Lord Chief Justice, in fact, when King, King James insisted upon entering into the King's Bench Court, at that time, Sir Edward Coke was the Lord Chief Justice. He protested. He barred the King from entering into the court. He asserted that judiciary must be independent of the King, that is the executive. Thus, the seeds of an independent judiciary were sown, or rather asserted, thanks to the Magna Carta. Because he said that the Magna Carta provides that the judges must be persons who are learned in law, who have spent years in learning the law of the realm. And he said, as a monarch, you are not that. You cannot actually decide the cases. You may appoint us, it will be your courts. You may dismiss us, but we will not concede to you the power to decide or the power to judge. Now, Sir Edward Coke reminded the king that under the law, only a person well versed in the laws of the realm had the authority to be a judge. The king was furious. He claimed authority by divine right, directly from God. To say that I am under the law is nothing but treason, he declared. Now, Pope would not budge. He quoted Bracton. Now, Bracton was another great lawyer, he was also an attorney general, again in the 13th century. And Bracton said, the king is under no man, but under God and the law. Because the law maketh the king. That was his principle. He said that, you are, you are not making the laws. It is the law which has made you the king and perhaps given you the power to make the laws. But it is the law which maketh the king. Now, Pope was dismissed. And not only dismissed, he was imprisoned in the Tower of London. But he did not meet the same fate as the de Brio's family. Public opinion was in his favour. This was in the 16th century. The monarch was compelled to release him. After his release, Coke entered the parliament and did much to revive the Magna Carta. In Commons, Coke even challenged using the word sovereign in relation to royal power. He said this was no parliamentary word. Magna, I quote Coke, actually I am pronouncing Coke wrongly. It is spelled as Coke, but you have to pronounce it as Cook. 
in Sir Edward Cook. So Cook said, Magna Carta is such a fellow that he will have no sovereign for companionship. Now let us look at another despotic king, Charles the First. Now Charles the First ruled England from 1625 to 1649. Now, what did Charles the First do? Charles the First ran roughshod over the parliament. By that time, parliament had been established. And Charles insisted that I am the king, I am the sovereign. So I don't require a parliament to aid me or to advise me. I will rule without the parliament. He even stormed into the House of Commons with warrants for the arrest of five parliamentarians, including Oliver Cromwell. A civil war broke out between the royalists and the parliamentarians. The parliamentarians were naturally led by Oliver Cromwell. The parliament won and they brought Charles to trial at the Westminster. Now seeing that the stacks were loaded against him, what did he do? He applied for a deferment of the trial. He sought for an adjournment. But the August Tribunal, now this was a tribunal which was trying the English monarch in the house of, in, in the Westminster Palace. But the August Tribunal pointed out to the king the great charter's words, inverted comma, to no one shall we delay justice, not perhaps in the sense in which they originally intended to. And they convicted Charles and ultimately beheaded him at the White House. Now his conqueror, Oliver Cromwell, was also not a great respecter of civil liberties. He suspended the parliament and he ruled as an absolute dictator for 11 years. He famously declared, your magna parta cannot control action taken for the safety of the common law. If you permit me, a one and a half minute detour, can we listen to Cromwell's speech in the parliament when he dismissed the parliament? If you don't mind, can we have a look at it? So that? My time to be put an end to your sitting in this place, which you have dishonored by your contempt of all virtue and defiled by your practice of every vice. Ye are factious, true, and enemies to all good government. Ye are a pack of mercenary wretches, and would, like Esau, sell your country for a mass of pottery, and, like Judas, betray your God for a few pieces of money. Is there a single virtue now remaining amongst you? Is there one vice you do not possess? Ye have no more religion than my thoughts. Gold is your God. Which of you have not bartered your conscience for bribes? Is there a man amongst you that has the least care for the good of the commonwealth? Ye sordid prostitutes, have you not defiled this sacred place and turned the Lord's temple into a den of thieves by your immoral principles and wicked practices? Ye are grown intolerably odious to the whole nation. You were deputed here by the people to get grievances redressed. You are yourselves gone. So, take away that shining bauble there and lock up the doors. In the name of God, go. So that is the speech with which he dismissed the parliament and ruled as a dictator for about 11 years. Ultimately, he was also failed. And Demo and parliamentary supremacy was restored. The principle of king or queen in the parliament came to stay. They invited, in fact, uh, Charles' son-in-law and daughter to become the monarchs of England, but they made them sign what is known as the Bill of Rights. Several conditions as to how they should behave. And they say that even today, at the opening of the parliament, when the queen comes to the Westminster Palace, there is a, I mean, they enact it even till today. The queen comes and knocks at the door of House of Commons. And the Commons, led by their speaker, open the door for a moment and then slam it at her face. So even till today, the monarch is not allowed an entry 
into the House of Commons. We can of course proceed to the House of Lords and then to the Common Westminster Hall, but she gains no entry in the House of Commons. But coming back to Magna Carta, the justice provisions in Articles 39 and 40 have survived till date. In fact, there are only three articles from the original Magna Carta which have survived to date. And two of them are Articles 39 and 40. The famous writ of habeas corpus evolved from these articles. What is the use of granting such a precious right but without any remedy? That is how the writ of habeas corpus evolved. The writ of habeas corpus is what guards these two articles. Then we come to another aspect of the Magna Carta, which is contained in Articles 12, 14 and 15. Now this addresses the issue of taxation or exactions by the king. As we have seen, the people were extremely fed up of continuous scrutage, continuous relief, continuous aid. So some provisions were specifically made to fix the rates of these taxes and the frequency at which they could be collected. But these articles also laid down a fundamental principle that became a war cry for the American War of Independence. Now these articles provide that except in three named circumstances, only three named circumstances, first is to raise a ransom for the king's person. So if the king himself is uh, held as a hostage, then the king can obviously raise taxes. Second is towards the knighting of the king's first born son. They said, okay, allowed. And for the first marriage of the king's first born daughter. Except for these three circumstances, the king would not, or rather the king could not levy any taxes like aid, relief, scrutage, without what was known as the common council of the real. Please note this phrase, common council of the real. Now one of these articles says that what is this common council of the real? They said that the common council of the real was to be sought by summoning an assembly of archbishops, bishops, barons, knights, and all those persons who held land directly from the king. And the article provides that all these persons have to be given a 40 day notice. The notice has to state the purpose why they are being assembled. And it is only if this assembly, if this common council of the real agrees for any additional taxation or any additional financial demands, would the king levy them. Now this assembly is nothing but embryonic parliament. Even today in England, Lady Hale, who was the Chief Justice of the UK Supreme Court, has said that even today her blood races when she receives a summons to attend the House of Lords. Because even today that summons has a 40 days duration. Even today the form is the same ancient form which they employed during the 13th and 14th century. Now this is the assembly which was the seed for the eventual assemblage of the people's representatives, the parliament. Even today, as I said, the MPs are similarly summoned. Thus, Magna Carta is important because perhaps limits were imposed on the monarch's power of taxation for the first time. For the first time, the people or the people's representatives were consulted before any taxes were imposed. And there, that is where comes the phrase of no taxation without representation. When England imposed taxes on American colonists, they rebelled. They said no taxation without representation. And they demanded and secured independence since representation was impossible. The Magna Carta was their icon. Now Donnellys, the, the two Donnellys and their son, have designed and sculpted the bronze door at the entrance to the US Supreme Court. This door has eight brass reliefs, illustrating the significant events in the evolution of justice in the Western tradition. For example, one of the reliefs at the end there, you can see Magna Carta written. So one of the reliefs depicts King John sealing Magna Carta. Another depicts Lord, England's Lord Chief Justice Cook 
barring King James from entering the King's court, making the court by law independent of the executive branch of the government. So this is the importance of Magna Carta. This is the importance of Lord Cook's symbolic election of saying that King James I, you cannot enter the court because the Magna Carta says that you are, unless you are well read in law, you cannot be a judge. So the bronze door of US Supreme Court has these eight reliefs and two of them have a direct connection with the Magna Carta. Even today, our parliament and state legislatures cannot levy taxes or spend the taxpayers' money without going to the people or the people's representatives. The financial bill or the budget as we popularly call it and which we take so much for granted is nothing but the echo of this principle of no taxation without representation. Now this idea was first spelled out in the Magna Carta. Finally, I mean there are several such articles, but finally let us refer to Article 61 of the Magna Carta which contains its security clause. So what does this article say? It says that if John were to transgress against any of the provisions of these articles, then a panel of 25 specially elected barons was given the authority to restrain and distress the king in all ways possible by taking his castles, his lands, his possessions, or in any other way, except perhaps touching his person and the person of his queen and children. So this was something which was revolutionary because no one imagined that the king would be made subject to the law. This is possibly for the first time that the king was told that if you dishonor this charter, these will be the consequences. These 25 barons have been given the authority to actually take away your lands, your castles and to somehow force you to comply with it. Now, if the king were to renege on the Magna Carta provisions, he would be under attack by his own subjects. So the charter allowed for a licensed civil war. There was no point in listing out the promises without a mechanism to enforce such promises by force if necessary. Now this again spelled out the concept of rule of law and not the rule of men. The subjects could not be expected to have unconditional fealty or allegiance. All that was subject to the king abiding by his charter and the promises of good governance. So this is again the site where the Magna Carta was. Uh, uh, there is something called as Melrose Chronicles. Now these Melrose Chronicles were contemporary to the signing of the Magna Carta. And look what the look what these Melrose Chronicles say. They say that England has ratified a perverse order. Who has heard of such an astonishing event? For the body aspired to be on top of the head. The people sought to rule the king. Now they say that this means that the rule of law was on its way. It is for the first time that the people said that yes, we are sovereign. We can rule the king. If the king does not follow the law, then we can take action against the king. So this was the comment in the Melrose Chronicles. So Magna Carta throws up two simple but profound ideas. First was that the English barons could conceive themselves as a community of the reality. Please imagine, that was a state where every baron felt that he was the monarch of all the land that he personally surveyed. But Magna Carta brought about the concept whereby he could think of collective rights rather than rights as an individual. The second was that the king was still the man who made the law, but now he had to obey the law as well. Friends, they say that the difference between a prince and a tyrant is that while both make and enforce laws, the prince subjects himself to the law. Now, Baroness Hale explains that rule of law is not a one-way traffic. The law which only the governed have to obey the governors have to obey it too. But what happened after all this? The aftermath, so to say. King John sealed the Magna Carta on 15th of June 1215. It was intended for peace, but it provoked war. It was legally valid for not more than three months. 
and its terms were never properly executed even during that three month period. In mid July, King John complained about this charter that was extracted from him under coercion straight to Pope Innocent III. On 24th of August 1215, the Pope annulled the charter. He said this was null and void. This is absurd, he said, that the king has to listen to the people. Absolutely unheard is null and void. The papal bull, because the Pope could speak through his papal bulls, the papal bull reached England only in September of 1215. And soon after that, a war broke out and the hostilities resumed. Incidentally, at Old Goa, we have what is known as the House of Bull. And when I made inquiries as to what this was, it is at the it is quite near to the Viceroy's Arm as one proceeds to the churches. So they say that the papal bulls that would be received from the Vatican were lodged there. And uh, I was told that such papal bulls are still available with our archives. That if they are indeed available, then I think that is uh, something that uh, needs to be preserved for the sake of history. Now, the war broke out. Within hardly three months from the execution of the Magna Carta, John renegade. John was not faring poorly in the war. In fact, this time, he was succeeding. However, London being with the barons was a significant handicap. On 12th of October, hardly a few months after the uh, signing of the Magna Carta, sorry, not a few months, this was uh, a year later, on 12th of October 1216, when John's entourage was crossing a low-lying wetland at a place called as Wash, a gush of water took away his treasures, clothes and provisions. This was a significant loss at a crucial junction. About six days later, that is on 18th of October 1216, John died of dysentery, having eaten too many peaches. This is the tomb of King John. They say that John demonstrated his utter incompetence by losing the crown and all his clothes in the wash and then dying of a surfeit of peaches and no cider. Thus his awful reign came to an end. The best thing that John did was that he died. Now his nine-year-old son, Henry III was crowned the king. William Marshall, a very wise and courageous baron, was named as the regent because the king was only nine years old. Several barons defected, saying that they had nothing against the boy king. Their problem was with King John. Several other barons invited Prince Louis, the son of Philip Augustus, the French king, to take over the English throne. The civil war continued to rage. In November 1216, Henry III, through William Marshall, defeated the rebellious barons significantly. And then, from a position of strength and without any coercion, Henry III, in fact it was the brains of William Marshall, but Henry III reissued the Magna Carta with certain modifications. That was a reassurance which the young monarch to Marshall gave to the English people that now this is no coercion. I have won the war. But of my own free will, I am reissuing the Magna Carta. I am re-giving you the promises which are contained in the Magna Carta, of course with certain modifications. The Magna Carta was reissued on 6th of November 1217, 11th of February 1225, and finally in 1297 as well. Only three of the clauses of the original Magna Carta survive. Articles 39 and 40, as we noticed, are the two of them. Friends, whatever may have been the significance of Magna Carta, that the cruel King John sealed it on 15th of June 1215, almost 800 years ago. Magna Carta today is associated with lofty principles like due process, proportionality, rule of law, independence of judiciary, no taxation without representation, parliamentary democracy, limited government. Friends, we must remember that what is history to us was simply the present for those who were involved at that time with these events. 
as Shakespeare reminds us in the twelfth night, what's to come is still unsure. Therefore, we must always be conscious that history is not made just by events, but history is made by particular people in particular times and their responses to these events. Permit me to conclude with a recitation of Rudyard Kipling's poem. It is titled as Weeds of Runnymede. Now, personally, I do not like the imperialist tendencies of Rudyard Kipling, but his two poems, one is titled as If, a wonderful poem, and the second is The Reeds of Runnymede. These are two of my favorite poems. So please permit me to end with this recorded recitation on the Reeds of Runnymede. This is the place where the Magna Carta was seen. At running age, at running age, what say the reeds at running age? The listen reeds that give and take, that bend so far, but never break. They keep the sleepy Thames awake with tales of John at running age. At running age, at running age, oh, hear the reeds at running age. You mustn't sell, delay, deny a freeman's right for liberty. It wakes the stubborn English ready. We saw and roused at running aid. When through our ranks the barons came, with little thoughts of praise or blame, but resolute to play the game, they lumbered up to running aid, and there they launched in solid line the first attack on rights divine. The Kirk's uncompromising sign. They settled John at Runnymede. At Runnymede, at Runnymede, your rights were won at Runnymede. No free man shall be fined or bound, or dispossessed of freehold ground, except by lawful judgment found, and passed upon him by his fears. Forget not. After all these years, the charter signed at Runnymede. And still, when mob or monarch lays too rude a hand on English ways, the whisper waits, the shudder plays across the weeds at Runnymede. And Thames, that knows the moods of kings, and crowds, and priests, and such like things, rolls deep and dreadful as he brings their warning down from running me. So dear friends, uh, thank you very much for all your patience and understanding. Thank you very much and Jai Hind. Thank you. It is involved and his address to us it is always filled with wit, humor, knowledge, and that is what we experience today. It was a fantastic rendition of the Magna Carta today, taking us back into history, the origin of the Magna Carta, to its relevance in the present times. The association is indeed grateful to you, sir, and indebted to you for giving us your valuable time today and presenting to us this aspect of Magna Carta, which perhaps none of us had experienced it in our law colleges or probably in our reading. The audio visual that you presented to us was something which we will take back as a real memory. Thank you, sir, for your time and for coming here and addressing us all. We also thank Honorable Justice Shinde, Justice Lakta, all the senior advocates, senior members of the bar, and my fellow colleagues who have taken the time out to be present here and attend this keynote address by Justice Sona. Thank you for your time and we look forward to having you more in the events to come. We will have such more events in the coming months too and interesting speakers are lined up ahead. Thank you one and all for your time this evening and see you soon again in the next month for yet another interesting talk by another speaker. Thank you one and all. See you again.